you want to listen deeply to people and, and what what a lot of people have is fear and if you can engage them in the conversation about what they're afraid of it can be a meaningful conversation if you argue with people and say what you believe isn't true that's not a good way to have a conversation about it mm. but but listening and caring about them is the way to start it Well, thank you for joining us once again on Insights Out. Uh, joining me today is somebody, Frank James, who's probably got one of the toughest jobs on the planet at the moment, that is medical officer. And Frank is a medical officer for San Juan County, the Nooksack Indian tribe. And he's also medical director for the Orcas Clinic. Uh, Frank, thanks for joining us and, uh, and correct me if I made any mistakes there, please. <laughs> it's usually, as you say, health officer. Gotcha, okay, sorry. <laughs> Can I just jump in at the deep end and say, where are we at at the moment in terms of COVID? Well, uh, where we're at right now with this pandemic, though, is we've go over, gone over a number of, of peaks in, in cases uh, through a number of variants. And I think this is really the crux of the whole pandemic right now, literally today. We have the most cases ever. Uh, the bug has evolved somewhat to be less severe. The particular version that's out there now doesn't affect the lungs very well. It does affect the upper airways. Um, so it's less, less likely to kill someone that has some immune protection. So not only has the bug changed, but we've changed. Our populations become much more competent immunologically. And so uh, now, for most people that have been vaccinated and boosted, the main symptoms we get complaints about are a headache, some congestion, uh, maybe not even cough or fever. And so it's really a, a mild upper respiratory infection for many people. Mm. So mild, yes, for some. Mm. And the big difference is it's so much more communicable. Right now, this disease, this version of the disease is going to penetrate our society incredibly deeply. There is going to be nowhere to hide. Yeah. Uh, so it's going, to, it's going to make up in volume for what it lost in severity. So milder, yes, but not for everyone. And literally everyone's going to get it at some point. Right, right. Now you're with, um, actually, let's just jump in on what your responsibilities are as, uh, as an officer. Routinely, it's uh, pretty boring. Um, health departments uh, ensure the health and safety of the population as a whole. And where the money's at on that is, of course, the, the exciting stuff is preventing infectious diseases. You know, if there's a measles outbreak or something like that, that's, that's pretty exciting. But honestly, the bulk of things are going to be safe water. So we regulate water safety, um, sewage disposal, um, restaurant safety. These are all things that can have huge impacts on a population if they're not done well. So what, in terms of COVID, what, what are some of the, the, the rules that you've had to kind of dish well, out? Well, COVID's been very, very different than that. And this has been an effort. Uh, usually I work eight hours a week in San Juan. This has been a 14 hour a day often job for two years now. It's a it's sole focus almost. Now we still have to do, if there's tuberculosis, we gotta take care of it. If there's, a, if there's measles outbreaks, we gotta take care of it in the middle of this. An unappreciated thing I think about COVID is that the long COVID or the, the long-term morbidity of COVID is really, can be, may be very substantial. Yeah. About 30% of people still have symptoms related to their infection six months after the infection's over. And we really don't know the depth and breadth of that yet. And with the, uh, let's just look at San Juan County. Um, what, <clears throat> what, what's the infection rate been there? How many people have been infected there? Well, um, one in 26 people has been infected. That sounds like a lot, but in most communities, it's one in 10 or one in three or one in two even. Mm -hmm. um, so we, are, we have the lowest infection rate of any county in the United States. And at, why would you say that is? It's a complex mix of things. Uh, our social vulnerability index is pretty low. That is, we don't have a lot of poor people. We have a pretty homogeneous population. That certainly makes it easier. But most, the other big issue is the geography, is that we're on an island, and, uh, and we've, uh, we're able to limit the, 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 tr the movement of people in a community pretty effectively, right. naturally. So those are the things on, on our favor to start with. Yeah. Kind of what's against us, what's challenging, is that 35% of our population is over 65 years of age. And that's a big deal. The biggest uh, risk factor for dying and for hospitalization is age. Yeah. 
Okay. So comparing but, old people with young people, you take 20 to 30 year olds and compare them to people over 65, there's about a 600 times greater likelihood of being hospitalized and 200 times greater likelihood of, of dying. But is there not a, a higher chance of an older population being more vaccinated? Or? Well, that was the goal from the beginning. Yeah. So currently, over 65, we have fewer than 200 people that are not immunized, and that's a huge achievement. We, we're, uh, we're the most vaccinated county in the state, um, wow. and we've worked very, very hard to achieve that. Now, keep in mind, of the things we'll talk about, routinely we have 2.4 FTEs of, of public health nurse. That's all we got to start with, and my work eight hours a day, uh, eight hours a week, pardon me. Um, and so we had, to, we had to bring that up a lot to be able to respond to this. Volunteers, additional hired staff, a, a lot of effort was put into having enough people to, to do the, that work. Yeah. And compliance, how, how did that go down? Is well, it the, going down? Well, the, the most important thing initially was not immunizations, because we didn't have them you know, for a long time. Early on, I've worked a fair amount in Asia, and I've studied pandemics, and so the first thing I did and it was very controversial, was I, uh, I in implemented a masking requirement. You have to wear a mask to be inside of a public building, mm. um, a business. At first, I wanted to make it so that everybody had to be, be masked and it could be enforced could be at the individual level. And the, the sheriff told me, I can't do that. At first, I thought he meant that he wouldn't do it, but he really meant that he couldn't do it. He doesn't, he's as strapped for staff as I am. We have very few deputies. It's hard to get new ones. Um, mm harder than it is to get a nurse, actually. Um, and so our lawyer, John Kane, who was brilliant, uh, said, it's okay, Frank, put the, the punishment or put the requirement on the businesses that, that allow people in. And so I put in an order very early on that said, if you allow someone in your business that isn't masked, it's a $1,000 fine and 90 days in jail. Uh, the, the, those punishments were suggested by the lawyer, too. I didn't come up with those. <laughs> Sounded pretty harsh to me, but it really worked dramatically. Um, a few businesses didn't want to do it, and I didn't send the sheriff over to arrest them or something. I sent the prosecuting attorney over to say, it really is $1,000, and it really is three months in jail. And people fell right into line. Mm -hmm. And then once it became normalized, and once people accepted that, it was really easy. And once we began to be successful, once you see how the, our rates far lower than other communities and, our, and, and not having any, any deaths at all, when other people were having deaths, other communities were having deaths, um, it made a big impact. And the community really began to own that. Uh, What's the general perception of you as, uh, as officer on, on well, the island? There, there certainly are detractors. There's a couple of dozen people that have adopted me on, 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 in cyberspace. My email is public, and so are my phone numbers. And, uh, and they call and tell me or, or email me and tell me regularly how stupid I am and how inept and ineffective and inadequate our response has been. But that's a handful of people. I mm. mean, if, if, if I've got two dozen people that don't like me, I'm okay with that. Yeah. I did get one death threat. Um, it wasn't completely credible. Uh, I checked it out, who the person was, and it didn't seem real. They also signed it, <laughs> which is a, <laughs> sort of a bad idea. Um, the, uh, and, so it's uh, more anger than anything in a way. Yeah, I think it was just, an ex you got to listen deeply to what people say. And he didn't mean he wanted to kill me. He meant he's, meant he's really angry about the situation and didn't yeah. like to be told what to do. Yeah. Um, and just, just following on that thread in a way, because, you know, you've got the, in terms of responsibility that, you know, the health of the individual, the health of the community and the health of the economy. And, I, you know, th there's got to be some kind of balance in there that you have to wrestle with. Oh, yeah. No, it's a really significant balance. I, early on, um, as I was impacting businesses, I, I began to realize these are my most important partners. And I developed a, a, a small group of business leaders that I routinely would go to. If I had an idea, I'd go and talk to them about it first and say, and often they would say, well, this is smart, but that part's stupid. We can't do that. You know, they would, they would really kind of tune me up and, and, and give me a much more realistic and much more pragmatic approach. We didn't always agree. There were times that I did, you know, we removed the masking. At one point, we went 52 days with no cases. We had eliminated the disease in our community entirely. This is kind of mid-pandemic. And, uh, and I, I took the masking mandate away, you know. Um, and then the, 
the Delta wave came and we needed to bring the masking back. And, and I first recommended it, and, and many people did it, but we really needed to make it universal because there's so many people that come from the outside, lots of tourists. Uh, yeah, yeah. Our population can nearly double in the community in the summertime. And so we, we did just that. We, I brought, brought it back. And one of the businesses, that's a very large, complex business that it really affected, one of his employees uh, that ran part of their business would explain to people they had to wear a mask to tourists, and they would scream at her, and she quit. And she was a pivotal individual in his, in his organization. He was very unhappy. And where we are now, what, what still frustrates you, and what, what gives you hope? <laughs> well, the natural inclination of human beings is to want this to be over. They want to go back to, we all, I want to go back to doing life the way I used to. I want to be able to go have a cup of coffee with friends. I want to be able to take a vacation. I want to be able to uh, go visit my friends. I want my grandkids to come sit on my lap. There's another thing that's really unique to this, and that is there's a, there are people that out and out lie. Um, who say things to make money. Some of the physicians that are very popular, kind of anti-vax stocks, they make tens of millions of dollars selling their books and videotapes and their, their crazy products that don't really work. Um, and, and people try to be nice about that, but I'm not nice about it. And they, these, are, these are people that lie and, and take people's lives and livelihoods. It's just wrong. Are and, you and coming across any of that at the moment? I mean, there was the old issues that uh people were trying as alternatives to... Well, ivermectin is a great example. I mean, I've used ivermectin a ton because I do global work, and it, it's a great drug for parasites, and it has antiviral properties. But if you give them enough to, to kill the virus, you kill the person. The, side of it is, the, 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 the effective dose is so high you can't do it. So for people that get led down this path of a conspiracy or uh, you know, being fearful about taking something for, for, for whatever reason, do you have some general response to that message that you could give from, from, from your point of view? Well, I, I, I always, you want to listen deeply to people and, and what, what a lot of people have is fear. And if you can engage them in the conversation about what they're afraid of, it can be a meaningful conversation. If you argue with people and say what you believe isn't true, that's not a good way to have a conversation about it. Hmm. But, but listening and caring about them is the way to start it. But there's a, a substantial group of people, that very small group that isn't immunized in our community, it's not very many people. You know, it's a very small percentage. And oddly, our lowest, in, in San Juan, our lowest immunization cohort, 50 to 64. And it's about ideology. It's not about access, not about cost, not about fear of side effects. It's, a, it's about an ideologic belief. They won't do it on principle then, is it? Yeah, and yeah. It's, you can't, um, I mean, and it's sort of like, you have to have these crazy beliefs to be part of the club, and they have a club. You know, there's a group of, there's a, a cohort of people that believe this together. Um, so as health officer, do you see your job getting easier from here on? If it got harder, I don't think I could do it, honestly. <laughs> um, and this is, the other people I need to protect right now are my staff. And mm. I've had people that, that um, you know, this has interrupted their career. They, 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 gave every, they gave so much they couldn't give anymore and they had to stop. Do you think that the public generally appreciate how much of a strain this has put on the staff of health department people? I don't think people can know what it's like to work. I mean, I don't know who else has worked 12 hours a day for two years. I mean, I've had two weeks off. A lot of my staff haven't had time off. And they've worked extraordinary long time, times. You can't make a mistake ever. You gotta keep working, even if the person that you're working with is obnoxious. I mean, this is the hardest work you could possibly do, honestly. Um, our people who do case contacts and investigations, they deal with everybody all day long, and some of them aren't very nice. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think generally in San Juan, people do are very appreciative. There's a whole big group of people that put up money so we could go to one of the cafes and get lunch every day for free. I mean, they're, they're, the, the community's done incredibly touching things, just like the little ladies that make the mask. Those are things that, that bring everybody's heart up. And, and it's out of an appreciation. It's part of being on the team. Um, but, but it's really hard to know what it's like to, to work that long and truly be exhausted. We've already done all the work to get us over this hump. Yeah. There's very little we can do now except take care of individual people. The public health isn't for individual health. It's for the population health. They're our patient. 
the whole population. Well, Frank, I wish you the best on this journey. <laughs> well, thank you. It's been, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Mm.